It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. Yesterday, the Premier stated that he intends to appoint his good friend Ron Tavener to the post of OPP Commissioner, regardless of the serious controversy around this appointment and, it seems, regardless of what any independent review may or may not find. Ron Tavener has admitted that he can't assume command under the cloud of suspicion created by the Premier. Why is your Premier so committed to proceeding? The Deputy Premier. Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. The, the, members of the, OPP, uh, the members of the NDP continue to bring forward unsubstantiated allegations about someone who, frankly, has a stellar 50-year career in the City of Toronto. And I think it's shameful that we are not actually allowing the integrity commissioner to do their job, do the investigation, have the report, and then I will be the first to stand in line to congratulate Ron Tavner as he takes his role as the OPP commissioner. Supplementary. It looks like the problem with this government is endemic to its entire cabinet. Exactly. Yesterday, I wrote to the Integrity Commissioner asking him to use his power under the Members' Integrity Act to conduct a full public inquiry into this matter. Given the importance of the OPP Commissioner's position, only a full public inquiry can ensure full public confidence and give the public the answers they deserve. Will the government support this request? Minister. It is beyond comprehension that the NDP do not consider the independent officer of the Assembly, the Integrity Commissioner, to be independent, to have the ability to put forward and do this investigation and bring that report forward. I have full confidence in the Integrity Commissioner. I am happy to wait for his report. I find it fascinating that we are here to talk about bringing, ensuring the power stays on in the province of Ontario, and yet the NDP continue to filibuster and choose to ignore the real issues that are facing the province of Ontario, which is heat and hydro for our people. Final supplementary. Honestly. Speaker, this is no longer about the Premier standing up for his buddy. It's about maintaining the integrity of our police force, our forces and confidence in this Assembly. Instead of working to restore that, the Premier has spent the last two weeks defending the indefensible and attacking the integrity of decorated police veterans who had the courage to speak out. Enough is enough, Speaker. Will the Premier and his government do the right thing and tell the Integrity Commissioner that we need a full public inquiry? Members, please take your seats. Minister. Mr. Speaker, respectfully, the NDP can't take yes for an answer. No. We have an independent inquiry going on right now. Let the independent officer do his work. For water, Let him do his, his uh, report, and then we can move forward on this very important appointment to for the York OPP Center comes to order. Next question, Leader of the Opposition. Well, speaker, my next question is also to the Deputy Premier, but I think that the minister responsible just uh, acknowledged that the government was happy to have a public King inquiry Vaughan, from order. the Integrity Commissioner. Thank you. We're very pleased about that. Look, the Premier stated that he played no part in the hiring process and that it's a complete coincidence. Uh, one of his closest friends, who was not even qualified for the position described in the initial job description, somehow ended up with the job. Is, it the, is the Deputy Premier aware if at any point the Premier discussed this career opportunity with his friend? Deputy Premier. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. I understand that in this chamber we have immunity, but it does not mean that we should be dragging people who have stellar careers of over 50 years serving the people of Ontario as a frontline police officer, dragging them through the mud. Here, here. Let the Integrity Commissioner do their job. That's right. Let us have the report. Mm -hmm. 
and let us move forward with appointing the OPP Commissioner the best person for the job. Well said. Supplementary. <laughs> well, perhaps this minister should provide the uh, same advice to her premier, who has dragged Mr. Blair through the mud quite consistently for a number of weeks. In fact, yesterday, yesterday, the premier took issue with Deputy Commissioner Brad Blair's letter to Ontario's ombudsman and to any suggestion that he may have met with Tavener during the appointment process. Is the deputy premier aware? If the, premier, if the Premier has had any meetings uh, with his old friend where this job was discussed. Minister. Unsubstantiated allegations, sullying people's careers, yep. and, most importantly, not allowing the Integrity Commissioner to do the work that you asked for a week ago. So which is it? You for the integrity commissioner to review the hiring process. Also come to order. He has agreed to do that. I am willing to let that work go ahead because frankly, he is an independent officer of the legislative assembly. Why won't the NDP? Once again, I'll remind members to make your comments through the chair. Start the clock. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, this government might not like it, but this official opposition will use every tool in our toolbox to get the people the answers that they deserve in a public forum. Members, take your seat. Through a Speaker, through a Freedom of Information request, we have learned uh, that the Premier met with then Member OPP Commissioner Bond, Vince Hawkes on July 25th. Is the Deputy Premier aware of the, pre of, uh, the Premier's uh, discussion with uh, Mr. Hawks and whether or not the plans for his retirement were discussed at that meeting? Yeah. Whoa. Minister. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister. Uh, I, I hope you understand how many people the Premier meets over the course of a week. I, I hope you understand that it is part of his job as the Premier of Ontario to meet with everyone in the province of Ontario who requests those meetings. So to suggest that there is something untowards because the Opposition Premier meets with the OPP Commissioner, I, I, I can't understand your uh, argument there. We have a Premier who is actively engaged in ensuring that the people of Ontario and the frontline officers get the support and tools they need to do their job. Why isn't the NDP behind that? Next question, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is to the, pre, uh, the Deputy Premier. Five days after his meeting with then Commissioner Vince Hawkes, according to our Freedom of Information request, the Premier found time to have dinner with Ron Tavener. This dinner meeting was not on the Premier's public agenda. Can the Deputy Premier tell us whether she is aware uh, of the uh, uh, Premier's discussions and if there was any discussion at that meeting with Mr. Tavener of the OPP Commissioner's job that was becoming available? The Deputy Premier. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. I understand that you can say whatever you want in this chamber without immunity, but it doesn't mean it's right to tear someone apart and to bring someone down who has 50 plus years of policing in the province of Ontario. To suggest that you can somehow have the, the right after 50 years of policing, to suggest that you can take that uh, public service and tear it down for partisan purposes, I think is shameful. Why aren't we talking about why we are here this week? Why aren't we talking about the fact that we have power workers' unions who have said they want to go on strike, and we are trying to avoid that to make sure that the people of Ontario have heat and light in the coming days? Supplementary. Speaker, for weeks the Premier has insisted that he had absolutely nothing to do with Ron Tavener's appointment, and with each passing day, new facts erode that claim. The Premier didn't recuse himself. The hiring committee included a friend of the applicant. The job description was altered. Now we learn that the Premier was out having secret meetings with his preferred applicant days after meeting with the then-OPP 
Will the Premier continue to defend the indefensible? Will his cabinet and this government continue to defend the indefensible? Or will this government join us in urging the Integrity Commissioner to use his powers for a full public inquiry? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. I understand the NDP want to spin a different tale than what is the reality. That is the purpose of the independent inquiry. That is why the independent inquiry is happening through the Integrity Commissioner. I am happy to let that work commence. I am happy to, to await those reports and see what the Integrity Commissioner finds out about the independent hiring process. But in the meantime, I remind the NDP we have pressing issues in the province of Ontario that need to be dealt with today, right now. I'm happy to wait for the report, but we need to deal with the heat and hydro in the province of Ontario today. Next question, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. Mr. Speaker, 50 per cent of this province's power generation is threatened if there is a strike at OPG. That would mean rolling brownouts throughout the province, including some of our remote, most remote areas. Mr. Speaker, across the province and in Northern Ontario, many people rely on electricity to heat their homes. Imagine what it would be like for a family to wake up Christmas Day without power. How could anyone risk subjecting their constituents to a cold winter? That's exactly what the members of the opposition are fighting for by voting against Bill 67. Can the minister please explain why it is so critical that the power stays on this winter? The Minister of Energy, Northern Development, Lives and Indigenous Affairs. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for uh, Eglinton Lawrence for outstanding work in this place and for her constituents. It's a privilege to work with her. For her to focus for her to focus on the issues that matter. Mr. Speaker, it's day five. Day five. We're almost 48 hours away from a stage, a critical window, where OPG will have to act on starting to wind down nuclear units, Mr. Speaker, compromising the supply of electricity. This is, this, this is completely accurate, Mr. Speaker. It's a fact. Now, New Year's is just on the horizon, and I see the NDP have already started with their fact-free diet, Mr. Speaker. But the truth of the matter is, is that in a couple of days, OPG and the power worker unions will start the process to wind down those generators, Response. Mr. Speaker, interrupting the supply uh, of electricity, compromising uh, electricity for families and business, Mr. Speaker. We're not going to stand for it. We're going to stand for it. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the minister. Apparently, the uh, opposition thinks they know more about how to run power plants than OPG, but wow. we have been warned that this could result in rolling blackouts and brownouts, and that's just for the GTA. Wow. Who knows what will happen if Northern Ontario faces a blizzard where the power might go out? Under these circumstances, the results could be catastrophic. Mr. Speaker, the minister is from Northern Ontario, and I'm sure he knows what kind of weather winter can bring. I'm seriously concerned that our northern and remote communities will face dangerous consequences. The opposition is also aware of this. In fact, last year their leader stated, we know already that there are people who are taking extreme measures, for example, hooking up appliances to gas power generators, which is not very safe. People are desperate, and they should not be cut off from hydro, particularly with winter coming. Through the speaker, I ask the minister, what are Ontarians in remote Hamilton communities West to and do? Dundas, come minister. I just thought of this, Mr. Speaker. The NDP not delivering power, not delivering power to the families and businesses of this province, Mr. Speaker, putting their ideology, Mr. Speaker, ahead of the needs of families and communities, businesses, Mr. Speaker, not just to celebrate Christmas, but for us Northerners to plunge into the heart of winter, 10 below in Timmins, 15 below in Kenora, Mr. Speaker, wind chill factors even colder. This is serious Opposition business, Mr. Speaker. We've convened in this place to ensure that the people of Ontario 
Ontario have hydroelectricity through the holidays and on into the winter. And we are getting dangerously close to a critical window Opposition where the, they're going to have to take action on interrupting that supply, Mr. Speaker. It needs to stop. So the NDP have got to stop filibusting this, Mr. Speaker. Quit with the delays. Stand up for the people of Ontario and keep our hydro. The House will come to order. <laughs> Start the clock. Next question, the member for Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. <clears throat> My question is for the Acting Premier. Yesterday, the Premier defended his Chief of Staff's demand that the OPP buy a personal pleasure wagon for the Premier and keep the costs off the books. The Premier suggested that the OPP could easily have acquired a used recreational camper van, probably off of Kijiji or something. Use. Can the Acting Premier share with the Assembly exactly where someone can buy a used, off-the-books, customized pleasure, pa pleasure, pl pleasure wagon? <laughs> Let me say that again. Customized personal pleasure wagon. <laughs> Members, please take their seats. The Deputy Premier. To the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Is so laughable, yeah. even the member opposite couldn't spit it out without breaking up. To suggest that there is anything wrong with the Premier suggesting that he'd like a used van because he wants some space to work so that he can call constituents and he can continue to work, I, I will Opposition never to order. understand why the NDP choose the questions they do. Well, they what I do understand is I am here this week to ensure that the power stays Order. in the province of Ontario. That is my job as a legislature. It is very, very unfortunate and Response. almost laughable that the NDP do not have that same sense of responsibility. None. Supplementary. Speaker, yesterday the Premier defended his Chief of Staff's demand that the OPP buy a personal pleasure wagon for the Premier and keep the costs off the books. Speaker, the Premier's Chief of Staff demanded that this personal pleasure wagon be off the books, and the Acting Commissioner raised serious concerns about this request. Instead of thanking the Government Acting Commissioner order. for his honesty and his integrity, the Premier launched into an unsubstantiated smear campaign against him. Yes. And he pushed the appointment of a man who shrugs and tells the Toronto Sun it's okay because, I quote, he's a big guy. Speaker, when will anyone on that side of the bench stand up to this Premier and tell the Premier that providing an off-the-books personal pleasure wagon is not the job of the Ontario Provincial Police? Members take their seats. Minister. I think the member opposite has missed his calling. He clearly would rather be a headline writer than a legislator. I know why I'm here. I'm here to defend the people of Ontario to make sure that we have power come Friday. I'm here to make sure that the people of Ontario have heat so that the seniors who are living in their homes know that they are going to be safe and secure in the coming weeks and days. I, th I think the uh, member opposite from Essex should probably look at career counselling because he clearly would rather write headlines than legislate. Next question, the member for Brampton West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. Mr. Speaker, the members of this House are well aware of the risk facing our province energy supply. The Power Workers Union voted to reject a collective agreement with Ontario Power Generation and are now in a strike position. 
This is the season of giving and celebration, and we cannot let the threat of rolling brownouts hang over the heads of our constituents. Then are you moving to Brampton? It's our job as Order. elected representatives to do what is right for then our are you constituents, to the people of Ontario. The member for Especially Brampton. during a time of year that is supposed to be one of celebration. Ontario Power Generation contributes a huge amount to our electric city system, and if its assets were to be shut down, Hamilton, it would be catastrophic. The member Brampton North. Can the minister Again, please explain order. why Ontario Power Generation is such an important piece of our province electric city system? Good question. The minister of Energy, Northern Development, Mines, and Industry. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank uh, the member from Brampton West for uh, his great question and the important work he does in his constituency. He's a fantastic colleague, Mr. Speaker. Put my glasses on here and read a few quotes, but before I do that, Mr. Speaker, uh, this is very serious. Notably, the independent electricity system operator, otherwise known as IESO, has stated that it would not be possible to replace all electricity generation once all OPG energy production was shut down. Mr. Speaker, we are just over 48 hours from that that becoming a reality. This is very serious, and I'm calling. I'm calling on the Northern MPs, Ms. Pease, Mr. Speaker. We get our hydro from dams up there, Mr. Speaker, and it appears that the No Dam Party doesn't want electricity to be sourced across our communities as we plunge into the heart of winter. Mr. Speaker, it's time to stand up for Northern communities. It's time to stand up for Northern families and ensure we have uninterrupted. Stop the clock. Come to order. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his continued leadership on this file. Here, 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 here. In my riding, seniors are worried they will be spending their winter months cold and in the dark. Shame. Old age communities in my riding and across Ontario rely on power to keep warm and to remain in communication with loved ones. Here, here. Hospitals, retirement homes, and long-term care facilities depend on safe and reliable power for their livelihood. The opposition makes the claim that these vulnerable populations have to choose between heating and eating, though by opposing this legislation, Mr. Speaker, they're ensuring seniors will not do either. Shame. Shame. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please inform this house as to how seniors in my riding of Brampton West and across Ontario will be able to keep their lights on this winter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, the, the member has a right to be concerned about seniors, about families, about businesses in their homes, Mr. Speaker. We heard a familiar refrain from the Leader of the Opposition today, um, using every tool in the toolbox. Now, Mr. Yep. Speaker, that was the statement that the NDP issued before the ink had dried on the notice to strike from the OPG workers, Mr. Speaker. Now they're filibusting this legislation, Mr. Speaker. They have an opportunity, but boy, have the time to change. Last year, the Leader of the Opposition stood in this House and asked the member for Don Valley West, under the serious threat of power being disconnected, why political credit is more important than stopping people from having their hydro cut off. Why, Mr. Speaker? Why? Thank you. Next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. We're still learning the full impact of this government's rash decision to cut $25 million from education programs. Every day, more details are coming out, and it's clear that school boards will be out of pocket covering for this government's mismanagement. Yesterday, the minister refused to provide any research or information used to support her case to cancel this program. Now, the Toronto Catholic District School Board has announced this. these cuts are going to result in immediate loss of 95 student jobs. This is just a drop in the bucket. That's only one school board reporting so far. There are going to be many more students left without employment. Speaker, the Premier said no jobs would be lost because of his cuts. Will this government reverse their cold-hearted decision and reinstate these important programs? Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Speaker. You know, 
This is an interesting time because this party opposite, the opposition party, is absolutely tone deaf when it comes to the fiscal crisis this province is in. We're spending four, $40 million more in expenses than we're bringing in in revenue. Every day. That is absolutely every day. Thank you, House Leader. Every day we're spending that. That is unsustainable. Ask the member to take your seat. Uh, both sides of the house have to calm down so that I can hear the member who has the floor. Minister of Education. So when we went through the line by line education programs and other funding, we were taking a very responsible approach. And it's important to recognize that when it came to this particular education program, the previous government had set up expectations, but there was no transfer payment agreement in place. Oh, and so the boards, it was a program that the previous government set up oh. as matching dollar for dollar. Yeah. So the well, boards are very done. much in a position. Thank you. Supplementary, the member for Kitchener Center. Back to the minister. Mr. Speaker. The education programming that the government cut was put in place to level the playing field for vulnerable youth. Students most impacted by these callous cuts are racialized and Indigenous youth and youth from low-income families. These cuts are examples of racism and classism being embedded in the educational system in 2018. These students are not efficiencies. They deserve every chance at success like their white peers and those in more affluent neighbourhoods. Students in my riding and across Ontario are again speaking out against the impact of these reckless and immediate cuts. The minister has said that, and I quote, the decisions we have made regarding EPO reflect our priorities. If the minister would listen, students would tell her that they are being set up for failure. Can the premier please, or can the premier, can the minister please explain to racialized and Indigenous youth and youth from low-income families why their access to an education that will set them up for success is an efficiency, uh, an efficiency that she has no problem cutting. Members, please take your seats. Minister. Thank you very much, Speaker. You know, the funding decisions that we made were geared and through a lens that if there were other programs in place, when Member times are tight, why on earth would we no. continue with redundant or duplication here, here. of programs? Back. Let me tell you what we're doing for racialized Position students. Come to order. Lincoln Alexander Awards will continue. Those awards recognize young people who have demonstrated exemplary leadership in eliminating racial prejudice or discrimination. We also are continuing with access to post-secondary education. This is to establish a network of in university school boards, schools and community organizations to design and pilot on-campus activities for black youth to think about their post-high school years and conceive of university and colleges as possible options, Speaker. Another thing we're doing is continuing to Member support for funding for the Black for Business Toronto Professionals Association National Scholarships, Spons. specifically for black university entrants. And, Speaker, we're doing so much more. We're actually investing its new investments of $20 million for mental health workers here, here. in secondary schools. Thank you. Thank you. I, re I recognize the member for Ottawa South. Seek unanimous consent, Speaker, to uh, ask the question on behalf of the member from Thunder Bay for your north. Member for Ottawa South is seeking unanimous consent of the House to ask a question on behalf of the member for Thunder Bay Superior North. Agreed? Agreed. 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 Member uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Deputy Premier. Speaker, uh, it's important that we take stock of the last six months. The government has cancelled contracts, sending the message to, Ontario, uh, to investors that Ontario is not open to investors. It is a plan for climate change with no real plan in its place. It cut the independent French language service commissioner, the child advocate, the environmental commissioner. It scrapped important labour protections and the minimum wage. It cut social assistance. It cancelled funding to the College of Midwives and for after-school programs for youth at risk. The Premier had time, though to find jobs for his friends, get a few fired, and asked for a camper ban to be kept off the public books. And all that we have under the tree is a downgrade from Moody's. So, Speaker, through you, will the Premier, Speaker, through apologize to the member for Ottawa South. The House will come to order. And put your question. 
Speaker, through you, when will the Premier stop being the chief conductor on his dream chain and focus on improving Ontario's economy? Thank you. The Deputy Premier. Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, you know, I, <laughs> I have to uh, uh, say how shocked I am that this member would talk about the situation, the financial situation that he and the Liberal government have put us in. You know, when you think about the fact, as I look over there and I look at the government who spent $40 million a day more than they took in, and somehow they thought that was responsible. So, Speaker, when you. It's passing strange that I can't hear the Minister of Finance because of the heckling that's coming from the government side. <laughs> Think about that. Start the clock. Minister of Finance, please conclude your answer. Well, thank you, Speaker. That gives me a chance to repeat what I had said. $40 million a day they spent more than they took in. How irresponsible you were to the people of Ontario. How irresponsible you were. Look what you've done to the province of Ontario. You ruined the province of Ontario's credit rating. That's what you did. Once again, I had to stand up and interrupt the Minister of Finance because of the noise coming from the government side. That's it. Time's up. Start the clock. Supplementary. There we go. Uh, thank, I think, thank the, I'd like to thank the Minister of Finance for that answer. And when he gets a signature of some accountant on the public accounts, <laughs> yeah, I'd, uh, an attestation that would be great. But, uh, oh Deputy Premier, Government Ontarians side, are order. concerned about the Premier's office's influence and interactions with the Minister Ontario Children, Police Force. Social Services. Of deep concern is the appearance of a conflict of the Premier appointing Work a close personal door. friend to the head of the OPP. And the changing stories and the wild accusations of the Premier and others don't help this at all. The Premier's Chief of Staff has tried to direct Toronto Police Service to arrest people. He's also requested that the OPP provide a special sole-sourced vehicle for the Premier and for it to be kept off the books and out of public scrutiny. Speaker, we have requested from the AG that she appoint a special investigator Question. to look at the Premier and his office's interactions with police, and we know that we need to do— These are two different questions. Go back to the finance the, the Minister of Finance can respond. Thank you very much, Speaker. It's interesting that the member talks about the government's books because the Liberals had a set of books that purposely didn't include the billions of dollars they spent on the hydro scheme just to present a budget that appeared to be balanced. But the bi billions of dollars they spent were all part of a scheme put on a different set of books. So, Speaker, I find it to use your expression, passing strange, that he would bring up books. Let me remind this government, they were spending $40 million a day more than they brought in. They should be ashamed of what they did to the people of Ontario. We, on the other hand, returned $2.7 billion of relief back to the people of Ontario. And we've saved the government $3.2 billion. $3.7 bill, $3 billion in savings. Clock. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Labour. Late last week, our government was advised that the members of the Power Workers Union had voted to reject a new collective agreement with Ontario Power Generation. In other words, the PWU is now on strike. Talks between the PWU and the OPG have broken down. Since that strike began, our government has been closely monitoring the situation. 
A strike at OPG would greatly impair the stability of Ontario's electricity supply and have a significant adverse impact on public interest, including the health and safety of Ontarians. Our government must ensure that Ontario has a steady, uninterrupted supply of electricity. Any labour disruptions at OPG would lead to an electricity shortage in Ontario. Can the minister assure the people of Ontario that the electricity supply will be maintained over the coming winter months? Minister of Labour. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore for her great representation of her constituents in this legislature. The people of Ontario elected our government to put their interests first, Mr. Speaker. That's why I introduced legislation to send this dispute to arbitration and protect Ontario's businesses and homes. The legislation was tabled on Monday, Mr. Speaker, and if this legislation is passed, it will terminate any strikes or lockouts between OPG and the Power Workers Union for the current round of bargaining. This will make sure the Ontario's electricity supply is not disrupted. If the legislation does not pass, Mr. Speaker, families, seniors, and all Ontarians face the possibility of no light, no heat during the winter months. Such an outcome would be unconscionable, Mr. Speaker. That's why we urge the party opposite to join us in keeping the light Response? on this winter. It's imperative. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you very much to the minister for that answer. OPG could not continue operations without PWU workers. This means that they could shut down all energy production with week, within weeks of a strike. A safe shutdown of our nuclear reactors could take as long as seven days. Restarting those reactors could take approximately 14 days. This would seriously affect the operation and stability of the grid. Again, Mr. Speaker, we are facing a potential provincial emergency. Speaker, action is required now. This is not the time for ideological posturing. The official opposition refuses to vote in favour of this legislation, thereby suggesting that the people of Ontario should be without heat and power this winter. Can the Order. minister please explain to this House why this legislation is so vital Question. to Ontarians? Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and the, the member is correct. OPG is responsible for approximately 51 per cent of all electrical generation in Ontario. A 51 per cent reduction in power supply is not something the province's families, seniors and businesses can handle during the winter months. My colleague, the Honourable Minister of Energy, Northern Mines and Development, has already discussed the potential impacts of this reduction, rolling blackouts across the provinces, families and seniors without heat or light during the Christmas season. Government should only intervene when the public interest and public health and safety are at risk and a resolution is not possible. This is the situation we are now facing. Our proposed legislation would prevent a severe disruption in Ontario's electricity that could greatly endanger our population. My honourable colleague is right that it's not a time for ideological posturing or political games. This is the time to band together and to take action. Mr. Speaker, again we ask the NDP to vote. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Brampton North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. <laughs> Deputy OPP Commissioner Brad Blair is a police veteran with more than three decades of service. Yesterday, the Premier made the serious claim that this decorated and respected public servant broke the law. Has the Attorney General or the Deputy Premier forwarded these serious concerns to the appropriate police force for investigation. Deputy Premier. To 
the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Ron Tabner also has a 50-year stellar career as a frontline police officer in the province of Ontario, Speaker. And I am going to remind the member opposite that if he the had Niagara been Falls, in order. Brampton a number of Christmases ago, he would remember there was a very severe ice storm that for three days shut down southern Ontario. It meant that people didn't have heat. They didn't have light. The reason we are here this week is to ensure that does not happen again. But then I guess he would have to live in Brampton to know that. <laughs> Supplementary. Government benches come to order. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I thought I would get an answer to that question, but obviously it's, it's cost me some money. So here you go. This is to the uh, member of uh, the <laughs> Hopefully I don't lose any more. Now, the question again is back to the Deputy Premier. The Premier's relentless attacks and insinuations on decorated police veterans aren't just unbecoming of a, of a Premier. They're baseless, they're cowardly attempts to undermine public servants who have done nothing but offer the truth, Mr. Speaker. First, the Premier attacked the integrity of former Commissioner Chris Lewis, and then he implied that the current deputy commissioner of the OPP broke the law, when the only thing he broke was the wall of silence surrounding the premier's plan to install a friend at the head of the OPP. Does the deputy premier support the premier's claim, or is she ready to admit that the premier is making baseless accusations? Members take their seats. Minister. I, I, I think I've just seen everything. We have the NDP gambling inside the legislative chamber, playing with people's <laughs> lives and making jokes while we try to pass legislation that is actually going to ensure that people have light and heat in the province of Ontario. Opposition, I, come to I, order. I think I've seen everything. NDP throwing Member money Essex, around doesn't surprise order. me. Gambling with people's lives, that's gone too far. <laughs> Start the clock. Member for Scarborough Rouge Park. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Our government has been clear. We have committed to meeting our share of the Paris Agreement without imposing a job-killing carbon tax on the people of Ontario. Last month, the minister released our government's Made in Ontario Environment Plan. This comprehensive plan laid out a clear path to ensuring Ontario continued its progress towards our target. But, Speaker, the work didn't stop there. Yesterday, as part of Minister's Next Steps, he announced part of our plan to reduce industrial gas greenhouse gas emissions for public comment in January 2019. Can the minister elaborate on what our government will do to ensure greenhouse emissions are reduced? Very good. Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member from Scarborough Rouge Park, and thank you for the to the member for the hard work he does on behalf of his uh, here, here. his constituents. Yeah, great guy. Mr. Speaker. Part of our Made in Ontario plan was to make sure that polluters pay, and that's why we are putting in place clear emission standards for industrial emissions. Mr. Speaker, we know that industry creates 29 percent of the emissions, so part of our plan, which will deliver on the Paris 2030 targets of a reduction, will include those, those standards. Mr. Speaker, we will be consulting on these West emission standards in, the, uh, in January and February. We did, as the member pointed out, um, notify the public that, that those consultations will begin. And, Mr. Speaker, most importantly, we will meet those 2030 targets. We will have a plan for the environment that's comprehensive, and we will not have a carbon tax. Yeah, right. Supplementary. 
Uh, thank you, Speaker. I know that the minister has been working hard at moving forward with the next steps of their plan. It's good to hear the next phase is well underway. Back to the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. As the year comes to an end and Ontarians prepare for another holiday season, for many, money becomes a concern. Ontarians have finally been able to feel some relief with the cancellation of their Liberals cap and trade program, relief at the pumps, and lower hydro bills. However, many are concerned that more costs could be on their way. Ontarians cannot afford another tax. They cannot continue paying higher costs on everything. Can the minister assure us all that this emission performance standard will not impact the hard-working people of Ontario? Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, unlike, unlike the federal government, unlike the NDP, Mr. Speaker, we've been clear. We will not be taking money out of the pockets of hard-working Ontarians with a carbon tax or a cap-and-trade system here, here. that punishes commuters and treats them as the polluters, when we know, Mr. Speaker, that high emission polluters need to pay their share, and they're willing to pay their share. 29 per cent of emissions come from those polluters. So, Mr. Speaker, our Made in Ontario plan will not have a carbon tax. Mr. Speaker, it will not have the highest carbon tax in the world, which Ontario, the NDP have advocated for. It's a fair plan. It's a common-sense plan. It's a plan that doesn't punish Ontarians. It's a plan that will meet our Paris targets, and it's a plan that will have no carbon tax. Restart the clock. Member for Toronto St. Paul's. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Last week, we learned that the Ford government made an in year cut to baseline funding to the Ontario Arts Council by $5 million. It also cut the Indigenous Culture Fund at the Ontario Arts Council by $2.25 million, suspending the program and causing a layoff of four Indigenous staff, four women Indigenous staff. The Ontario Arts Council had not received a funding increase to their base budget since 2009, and the new Indigenous Culture Fund was a significant part of the government's commitment to upholding the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. Why is this government intent on dragging this province backwards in its support for the arts and Indigenous culture? Minister of Tourism. Members, please take their seats. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question. First off, this government believes that professional artists and arts organizations play an important role in building a strong, prosperous economy while making valuable contributions to the quality of life in our province's communities. This government was elected on a commitment, Mr. Speaker, to restore trust and fiscal responsibility to the province. As such, every area of government shares a commitment to spending taxpayer dollars responsibly and efficiently, and all agencies are finding savings. Therefore, we will continue to invest in Ontario Arts Council at the 2017-2018 level of $64.9 million. Ontario is reviewing the Indigenous Culture Fund to ensure Spons. that taxpayer dollars are being used responsibly and efficiently to maximize the impact of Indigenous cultural support. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is rather disgusting that Indigenous arts would be the place where the PC government would be looking for efficiencies. We know that the arts are a key economic driver in this province. However, cuts to the Ontario Arts Council will mean hundreds of unfunded cultural projects that would have created jobs, training and education opportunities, boosted tourism, generated re revenue, engaged community wellness, and revitalized Indigenous culture throughout our province. Arts communities in Ontario, and in particular Indigenous communities, deserve better. However, all we have seen from this government is cuts and no clear plans for arts and culture in the province, especially within vulnerable, marginalized communities. 
Why is this government so committed to squeezing out Indigenous culture over and over again? What more senseless funding cuts Question. to the arts and to Indigenous culture in particular should we expect? Minister. Mr. Speaker, what's disgusting is the fact that we're spending $40 million a day more than we're bringing in, and the fact that we have to find efficiencies to ensure that Indigenous people and all people that are in the arts have Order. funding today and for the future. Mr. Speaker, for Toronto, the, arts Saint Paul's Council, come Mr. Speaker the Arts Council is not organizationally part of the ministry, and they're responsible for their own staffing decisions. Member for Toronto St. Paul's, come to order. Mr. Speaker, I also want to bring to light the fact that, through support from our government, the Ontario Arts Council currently offers support to Indigenous artists through the following grants programs, the curatorial projects, dance training projects, Indigenous artists in communities and school projects, Fonts. Indigenous arts projects. Indigenous presenters in the North, music projects, Indigenous visual arts materials, skills and training. Thank you. The minister will take his seat. Well, I remind members when the, when the speaker stands, your microphone shut off. Next question, the member for Mississauga Centre. of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Our government is committed to making Ontario the best place in North America to do business and make investments. I know that the minister has been working diligently to create a better, more competitive business environment by fighting for lower taxes, lower hydro rates and cutting suffocating red tape. Yesterday, the Premier and the Minister were at an announcement in downtown Toronto about new jobs that are coming to Ontario. Speaker, can the Minister inform the House of the details of this announcement and how our government for the people is bringing good jobs back to Ontario? The Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, thank you. I want to thank the member from Mississauga Centre for a great question yeah, this yeah. morning. Uh, the Premier and I had a great morning yesterday. We were in downtown Toronto at the headquarters for Amazon, and they were introducing 600 new Refreshing. jobs in the heart of downtown Toronto. It's part of their headquarters building there and their tech hub. Uh, that they're implementing. They've got a lot going on in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. They're building two new fulfillment centres to add to the four that they already have here in Ontario. These are good, well-paid, full-time jobs in Ontario, yeah. Speaker. Yesterday, we had the opportunity to get a demonstration of Alexa, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard about Alexa. You can ask Alexa to turn down your television, turn up the radio station, turn on the lights, turn off the lights. Oh, turn yesterday, the lights. Huh. yesterday, I had an opportunity Remember to ask Mark Alexa Center to turn on the lights. I, I asked Alexa, I said, Speaker, Speaker, I said, Alexa, why would the NDP not support us in turning on the lights in Ontario? And they said, well, Minister, there's no Thank you. delivery of power. Thank you. Speaker, I welcome Amazon's creation of 600 new jobs, good paying and stable jobs in Ontario, and I know that the minister does too. I also know that Amazon has welcome uh, keeping the lights on over the holidays. Amazon gave a number of reasons for their investment in Ontario, which will almost double the number of employees at their Toronto tech hub. Our government's commitment to making sure that Ontarians have the skills to match the job market is crucial for attracting more companies like Amazon to Ontario, as we make Ontario open for business and make our province the economic engine of Canada once again. Speaker, can the minister tell the House what our government for the people is doing to attract companies like Amazon to Ontario to create good, stable jobs? Great question. Thank you. Minister. 
Speaker, we are doing a lot, and thanks again to the member from uh, Mississauga Centre. You know, one of the things that Amazon highlighted during our visit yesterday was the highly skilled workforce that we have here in Ontario, our public education institutions like University of Waterloo and the University of Toronto. There were a lot of grads that were working there yesterday. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's why our government has put such an emphasis on training people for the need that we're going to have in this high-tech market. You know, one of the first things we did was get out of that out-of-date special interest driven apprenticeship ratio that we had in Bill 47, yeah, yeah. the Making Ontario yeah, yeah. Open for Business Act. We eliminated that one-to-one -one ratios now across the board, and we introduced Bill 66 a couple of weeks ago, which is going to pave the way to ensuring that we get these great jobs locating here in Ontario. We're going to make Ontario open for business, Mr. Speaker. As a matter of fact, Amazon Fox. would tell you, and they told us yesterday, Ontario is indeed open for business. 600 new jobs. Yeah, yeah. Merry Christmas. Once again, I'm going to remind members that interjections are always out of order. And secondly, uh, we have a custom and a habit of not making reference to the absence of any, any member for obvious reasons. I shouldn't need to continue to explain that. Start the clock. Next question, the member for London North Centre. Speaker, my question is to the Acting Premier. In September, over 40,000 students walked out in protest of the curriculum repeal, but the government didn't listen. Educators, health care providers, and school boards all warned about the increased risks to students' health and safety, and still this government didn't listen. Just this week, it was revealed that the overwhelming majority of parents who participated in the online consultations want to keep the modern sex ed curriculum, but the Premier refuses to listen to and respect Ontarians. Instead of acknowledging real concerns, he pushed back by saying that certain groups skewed the results in the parent consultations. Can the Acting Premier tell us specifically who the Premier was referring to when he says certain groups? Deputy Premier. Minister of Education. Minister of Education. And thank you to the Deputy. The and Speaker, I'm very pleased to address this question. You know, this has been an absolute wonderful opportunity over the last three months to be reaching out across Ontario and, and deal with a situation that's very near to parents students and teachers and the broader community alike. And do you know the fact of the matter is we have an amazing system in which we've heard from tens of thousands of people. And I am so looking forward to there's so much data and I'm so looking forward to crunching through it through the month of January to determine the best path forward. Opposition you know, I need to remind everybody, you know, when the health and physical education curriculum is referenced, it's important to recognize that the high school curriculum was not touched. Never changed. And if we are moving forward, and teachers are supportive in the terms of participating equally as parents and children in Response. our consultation. This is going to be one for the history books, and I'm very proud of how it's been facilitated. Hey, 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 hey. The history book. Supplementary. Speaker, since the minister can't or won't answer the question, my question is back to the acting premier. We have a word over here for the people the Premier calls certain groups. Ontarians. <laughs> Ontarians have spoken, and they want a modern sex ed curriculum reinstated right now. Ontarians don't want divisive and regressive politics. Ontarians want students to learn about consent and to use a curriculum that recognizes the existence of LGBTQ people. Ontarians want students kept safe. This government didn't need a consulta consultation process to show them that. But now the Premier doesn't like the results and uses divisive language and poisonous politics. The Premier's friend, former PC Order. leadership candidate Tanya granick who strongly opposes the modern sex ed curriculum, used robocalls urging Ontarians to participate in the consultations yeah. and skew the results. Can the Acting Premier tell us whose fees back the government is listening to since the Premier wants to divide respondents, divide Ontarians, and use students as pawns? The member will take his seat. And the Minister of Education will respond. Speaker, Editor. let me be perfectly clear. 
We stand as the PC government together with Premier Ford in ensuring that our classrooms right across Ontario are the safest and the best learning environments ever. We are absolutely committed to moving the bar forward, and our consultation has been so rich in the data that we're receiving, I can tell you that it's going to form education policies for years to come. Again, I stress on the fact that we've had tens of thousands of people come forward sharing and talking from their hearts, and we are absolutely committed to making sure that we clean up the mess that the previous Liberal government thrust and forced upon Ontarian students and teachers and parents. Speaker, we are Response. getting it right, and we are basing everything going forward on the results of that data yeah, that yeah. we received in the consultation. Thank you very much. Order. Next question, the member for Kitchener Centre. Mr. Speaker, my question is to yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. Earlier this week, the minister was in Kitchener making a very important announcement. As a representative of this area, I know that transit is a very important topic for Waterloo Region. Our government, for the people, is committed to fixing the gridlock in the City of Toronto and other cities across the province. We are committed to getting the people of Ontario moving so they can spend more time with friends, family and loved ones. It is unfortunate that under the previous Liberal government, they were fiscally irresponsible and out of touch with transportation issues that Ontarians continue to face. Can the Minister of Transportation inform this House how his announcement in Kitchener earlier this week will assist in getting people moving across the province? The Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to uh, thank the member from Kitchener Conestoga for that question. I really want to uh, thank the uh, members from Kitchener South Hespeler and Cambridge, and of course uh, my PA, uh, uh, Kinga Surma, uh, for also working hard on this issue. I can tell you that all three members of this caucus uh, continually discussed uh, transit in the Kitchener region. I've been pushing for all-day-go uh, delivery of, of, of uh, transit, and uh, with our announcement last week, um, we have moved forward with new uh, trains going to and from uh, Kitchener to uh, Union Station. Um, starting on January 7th of this year, a new 5.40 a.m. trip out of Kitchener will serve all stops between here and Union Station arriving at 7.43, with a later train in the day arriving in Kitchener at 5.43. Mr. Speaker, Response? I, uh, I am certainly proud of the work this government has done with regards to transit. We're going to do a lot more for this province. We're going to get Ontario moving again, and uh, I look forward to the supplemental because I have a lot more to share. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Minister of Transportation for the great response. This announcement is fantastic news for the people of Waterloo Region and is an important step in our government's plan to deliver two-way, all-day GO train service between Kitchener and Toronto. This means a 25 per cent more train service for the people in Kitchener and around Waterloo Region. It is clear that our government for the people is transforming the way Ontarians move around our province. We are also growing our economy and creating jobs and uh, the high quality of life that people in Ontario deserve. Our government is finding better and smarter ways to work with our partners and current infrastructure to deliver more transit rides faster and at a lower cost to the people. Can the Minister of Transportation elaborate further on the expanded Go Rail service in the Kitchener region? Mr. Uh, thanks again for that question. Mr. Speaker, by working with our partner CN, we're able to significantly accelerate our timetables to introduce new services to the Kitchener line. This means we're speeding up negotiations to free up track time so that we can deliver on two-day, all-day ghost train service on the Kitchener line as soon as possible. I can confirm that we are extending morning service to Toronto from the Brampton and Mount Pleasant GO stations. New GO train service will give people more flexibility in their busy work days, helping them to spend more time with their families and on, on, away from their commutes. Our government is committed 
to continuing growth of transit in this province. I would hope the members on the other side, the member uh, from Waterloo stops being a barrier, works with us like yeah. our other colleagues have done in the Niagara region. That concludes question period for this morning. Member for Aurora, Oak Ridge's Richmond Hill has a point of order, I understand. Mr. Speaker. Um, Speaker, I would like to welcome to the Legislature Dr. Imam Saeed Faizi of Al Nadwa Educational Islamic Center and visiting us from India on his educational tour from the University of Lucknow, Professor Nushir Hussain Siddiqui. Welcome to Ontario, welcome to the Legislature. been advised the member for Timmins has a point of order. Yes, uh, Mr. Speaker, I would like to move a unanimous consent motion without debate that a select committee be appointed to investigate and report on the practices and process related to the appointment of the OPP commissioner. Mr. Timmins is seeking the unanimous consent of the House to move a motion with respect to the establishment of a select committee. Agreed. Heard some no's. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Ottawa South has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of Finance concerning the controller signature on public accounts. This matter will be debated today at 6 p.m. We have a deferred vote on Government Notice of Motion No. 29 relating to the allocation of time on Bill 67, an act to amend the Labour Relations Act 1995. Call in the members. This is a five-minute bell.
Will the members please take their seats? December 19, 2018, Mr. Clark moved government notice of motion number 29 relating to allocation of time on Bill 67. All those in favour of the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith Bay of Quinty. Mr. Smith Bay of Quinty. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Bethlehem Fowler. Mr. Bethlehem Fowler. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Yurick. Ms. Mulroney. Ms. Mulroney. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Tabola. Mr. Tabola. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pet. Mr. McDonnell. Oh, Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Miller. Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller. Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Kalanda. Mr. Kalanda. Ms. Serma. Ms. Serma. Mr. Parson. Mr. Parson. Ms. Skelly. Ms. Skelly. Ms. Triantafilopoulos. Ms. Triantafilopoulos. Mr. Sakari. Mr. Sakari. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Kusendova. Ms. Kusendova. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Mrs. Carhalios. Mrs. Carhalios. Mrs. Fee. Mrs. Fee. Mr. Smith. Peterborough Quartha. Mr. Smith. Peterborough Quartha. Ms. Kanjan. Ms. Kanjan. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Cram. Mr. Cram. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Tang. Mrs. Tang. Mr. Baum. Mr. Baum. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Anon. Mr. Anon. Mr. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Ms. Dunlop. Ms. Dunlop. Mr. Canapati. Mr. Canapati. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Babbitt. Mr. Babbitt. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Sabau. Mr. Sabau. Mr. Tanagas. Mr. Tanagas. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Cusetto. Mr. Cusetto. All those opposed to the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Madame Gellion. Madame Gellion. Mr. Tab. Mr. Tab. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Ms. Singh Brampton Mr. Center. Mr. Bantoff. Mr. Bantoff. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Beckham. Ms. Beckham. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Mr. Mamako. Mr. Mamako. Mr. Yar. Mr. Yar. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Styles. Ms. Styles. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. West. Mr. West. Mrs. Stevens. Mrs. Stevens. Mr. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Oh, oh. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. French. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Andrew. Ms. Andrew. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Birch. Mr. Birch. Ms. Burns McGowan. Ms. Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Bourguin. Mr. Bourguin. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Ray Kosovich. Mr. Kosovich. Mr. Harden. Mr. Harden. Ms. Monty Farrell. Ms. Monty Farrell. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Mr. Schreiner. Mr. Schreiner. The ayes are 65, the nays are 39. The ayes being 65 and the nays being 39, I declare the motion carried. This House stands in recess until 3 o'clock this afternoon.